all of his accomplishments. I'll just highlight a few because I want to spend most of the time talking with him, not talking about him. But Bramwell has made a profound difference in music in Canada and has received the Order of Canada in that recognition. He was the music director of the Winnipeg Symphony for 12 years and has now the, has the title of music uh, conductor laureate. He was most recently the music director of the Vancouver Symphony for I think 18 seasons, is that right Bramwell? And is now their music director emeritus. Um, he has done, he has been a resident for a guest conductor for the Calgary Philharmonic. He was the artistic director of Calgary Opera for whom he wrote The Inventor, a massive undertaking because Bramwell is not only a brilliant conductor, but he is an extraordinary composer as well. He is a Grammy and Juno award winner. He has been um, in resident positions with both the New York Philharmonic, the LA Philharmonic through Hollywood Bowl. He's currently still the music director of the Rhode Island Symphony, not to mention all of his guest conducting around the world and a stalwart of British um, orchestras where he made his debut at the British proms last summer. Um, he is such an accomplished man, but really for me, what Bramwell is, is the most generous educator. And he brings that to bear in all aspects of what he does. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bramwell Toby. Yay! <laughs> I can see them clapping. Bramwell, tell me, first of all, welcome and thank you. Well, for thank you. I wish, I wish my mother had been alive to hear that. <laughs> uh -huh. I loved your mother and she was so incredibly proud of you. She would have been 101 by now. So. Uh, she was an amazing woman and I know how proud she was of you. I, I had the great fortune of meeting her in Winnipeg. And um, I just want to ask you right off the bat, what do you love about conducting? Um, you know, uh, I, I've always found conducting a little onerous to tell you the honest truth. Um, I, uh, when I started off, I enjoyed the, uh, the sense of authority over the sound. And as I got older, I began to realize that the transaction between me and the musicians was way more profound and important than controlling the sound. It was about empowering musicians. And I began, and that's when I really started to get somewhere because I didn't really appreciate it until I understood that principle. And as that time went on, I realized that actually different musicians in the orchestra needed different empowerment. Some needed um, uh, complete support. Some needed uh, simply recognition from me that I completely trusted them. Um, others needed me to just get out of their space and just completely enjoy what they did. And that actually it was a combination of all these things. And so I began to enjoy it and appreciate it much more the older I got. And then two years ago, um, I know you're gonna talk about this in a minute, um, I got cancer and uh, I was um, unable to conduct. At that time, I thought for the longest period ever in my life, <laughs> I couldn't conduct for uh, four months. And um, I had a form of uh, chemotherapy that uh, reduced at that time temporarily because, you know, um, chemo takes out your hair roots. This one was very heavy on the hairs in my inner ear and I had problems hearing the orchestra um, with the usual clarity. It's all returned now, it's fine now, but I had to be taken off this particular chemotherapy. And I went to the Hollywood Bowl to conduct the Los Angeles Philharmonic and my hearing was not great. It was about 50%. And, um, you know, the Hollywood Bowl is a huge event. I've been going there for 20 years or some, and I had a close relationship with the orchestra. And when I lowered the baton and felt the power of the musicians, all of whom I knew by name, and were all friends and colleagues of mine, it was overwhelming. Uh, your question was, what do I enjoy about it so much? Well, I realized that actually that means of expression, <laughs> out of empowerment, uh, and of being, a, a, being dedicated to enabling me to support those musicians, that's actually an incredible honor and an incredible privilege and it brings with a great duty to make sure that you don't abuse it or, um, or act wrongly in any way. And so um, I've come to realize that that duty is a privilege. It's um, an expressive privilege. And whether I'm conducting my music or somebody else's, whether they're dead, whatever um, background they come from, um, and, wh and whatever standard of composition they are, whether they're a beginner or whether they're, um, you know, uh, Beethoven or Brahms, it doesn't matter. Um, it's a great responsibility. And um, 
I've actually, I actually revel in that. I last conducted um, at the proms, actually my debut with the proms was a few years ago, day 2012, so, but I oh was my. last at the proms in last summer. Right. And um, the last time I conducted was uh, August 31st, I think it was. And the time before that was March um, uh, 9th or so in San Diego. So normally I conduct 150 concerts or thereabouts a year, um, I think I've conducted seven in the last 12 months. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to getting back to it. So it's a great privilege and a great honor to answer your question rather long-windedly. I apologize. No, no, it, it was a beautiful answer. And um, so I wanted to ask you, I know that as I was training, I remember you talking about, you know, to really be successful as a conductor, it is, it is both becoming really skilled musically, but also really having an understanding of human psychology not to put it you know make it too technical but but to really understand the motivation of the different individuals and never to forget that your instrument the orchestra is made up of human beings so as you were just talking about getting to feel who needed what from you have you noticed that that is at all dependent on the group of instruments like do you have you seen the strings need something different than winds need something than different than brass or is it just more about the individual personalities um, there is inevitably, you know, um, a surface generalization, I think, as we know, I, we all make jokes about viola players or brass players or, or whatever, or triangle players or conductors, you know, we just, and we're all pretty shameless about that. And um, you have to take it and give it in the right spirit. And it's part of the relaxation of the atmosphere to an extent. And it has to, you have to be very careful and sensitive with it and always be self-deprecating if you possibly can. Anyway, um, that aside, um, I've found that generalizations have not helped actually. I've told the story, I think uh, many times about the horn player in, um, in Winnipeg who wore a biker jacket. And I saw him arriving on a bike to rehearsal with his horn strapped to his back and he got off with jeans and I saw this guy and when he took his helmet off his hair was cropped like a skinhead and um, I was new at the orchestra and I was thinking oh my god who's this guy I don't want to get on the wrong side of him <laughs> well you know that turned out that man who you and I both know who that is the former second horn player turned out to be the orchestra's personnel manager his wife, Cheryl, was a gifted pianist. She worked in a prison as a prison worker. Norm was one of the gentlest, kindest, most charming people. And so my snappy little generalization was utterly wrong. So I, I have noticed that actually um, often too, you can see somebody looking aggressively back at you, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're being aggressive. They're wanting to perhaps understand what it is you want. So I try and keep a dialogue going. I never ever, I mean, when I was younger, I made mistakes all the time. So I didn't do all these things. I didn't always learning them. But as I got older and began to understand the psychology, I realized that if there's an issue in a rehearsal and um, it gets, uh, it becomes difficult, best to move on, go and talk to the player during the break or um, find out from the personnel manager what, you know, if there's any issues. You never know. People have issues with their children. They have issues with their health. And one doesn't want to, the last thing you want to be seen as the leader of a room is to be rough on someone who everybody knows is ill, but you have no idea because you haven't bothered to inquire. So um, I think I try and I've tried to acquire a sixth sense into all that. And I do think it is important. Of course, you know, people understand um, if you if you mess up, as long as your personal conduct is filled with uh, or, or is clearly um, focused on integrity if you're um i find that you know um these old tapes that exist of toscanini for example conducting a rehearsal in italian of brahms second symphony and screaming at the double basses i've met toscanini's granddaughter in um, new york when i conducted um, a performance of toscanini's execrable arrangement of the, <laughs> of the star spangled banner and she came to the um, performance and I met her and she's absolutely delightful. She's in charge of, um, or she does something for the performing rights of composers in New York. And she's just a, a lovely person. I hadn't heard this tape when I met her. And you know that there's this generational shift and that's a good thing. 
And I do think um, that uh, it's right for us to realize that the past um, wasn't a perfect place. They did things differently there. And um, we need to make sure that when the time comes for this period of the past to be reviewed, that we're doing things as well as we can. So understanding psychological, psychological issues and not making sweeping generalizations I've found to be very important. I think you're absolutely right in terms of how the profession of conducting has changed, of course, over the decades. Um, can you speak a little bit to how you approach, is there a difference in your approach when you are arriving somewhere as a guest conductor, who maybe even for the first time, compared to what you are thinking about when you're a music director and you know the or you've been conducting that orchestra for 15 years? Is there a difference in how you approach your conducting in that regard? Um, there used to be a much bigger difference when I was younger, before the days of the internet, um, I would go to an orchestra and people wouldn't have a clue because there's nothing to look up. There was only the bio that was sent around by agents. And as we all know, orchestral musicians, um, if they're any good, and they generally are very good indeed, they don't trust a single word in an artist's bio <laughs> until they've seen it for themselves, right? Dominique, I can see her laughing. I see lots of our musicians yeah. nodding and smiling. You know, I mean, <laughs> these things are written by um, agents and by press people and they're, they're full, of, um, full of garbage. I've seen it written in other professions too. I mean, whoever read an imperfect or a selfless um, bio of a lawyer, for example, um, you know, <laughs> these things don't exist. These things are... Uh, these things are written to attract clients. And, as, and it's the same with um, anyone who has a public bio. Um, my, all my bios are written by other people nowadays, so I don't really have to worry about it. But um, the, the issue of, um, of going to an orchestra now means that everyone's read everything there is about you. They know how many times you get married. They know uh, how many kids you've got, uh, what your dog's name is. Everything's up there. And my dog's dead, by the way. But you know they've got all this information and, uh, and then um, they, they also read, oh, you know, Bramwell's got a reputation for being humorous. Well, you know, when you read out all that bump about me earlier, it's a bit embarrassing to hear all of that. And I made that quip about which my mother was still alive. And I first made that spontaneously in front of the Pittsburgh Symphony about 12 or 13 years ago when somebody read out all this thing and clearly no one at the Pittsburgh Symphony had been bothered to look me up. And when they finished this, I could feel the orchestra were looking up and going, so what? And um, I made the quip and that, you know, it just helps to calm the atmosphere. And I found that humor is a great way to break down barriers between people. And um, to, if you were inviting someone to your house for dinner, you wouldn't be formal and rigid with them. Um, uh, the guest sitting next to you is a, and then, you know, you don't, we, we don't do that. And yet we want to create that kind of atmosphere when we're in rehearsal. So I've found humor um, a very important thing, but humor to be genuine and authentic has to be spontaneous. You can't recite a litany of, these are the gags I use and I'm gonna use them in this rehearsal because it doesn't read right. So um, the best thing to do is to keep your ears posted because musicians are very funny by and large. Musicians use humor to help um, reduce the stress in their individual practice and rehearsal sessions. And if you can enter a dialogue in that way, um, you know, it makes it more relaxed. So I find that now that I'm older, I'm 67 now and I go to orchestras, most orchestras I go to, uh, people know exactly who I am. And, uh, uh, and when I show up, they kind of know what to expect. They've seen me on YouTube or whatever it is. So, um, you know, people aren't generally going, uh, who's this guy? But who's when I was guy? younger, uh, it was it was tougher. Yeah. So, Bramwell, um, I think most people know that the day that I met you was a life changing day for me because um, I had and my own, my oh, you're so sweet. I we had um, the audition process for the first resident conductor in residence position at the Winnipeg Symphony, where you were the music director. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I became the first kind of conducting assistant that you had. You were, exactly. I, I yes. We used to joke about me breaking you in. <laughs> and, uh, it's true. And I know that um, 
one of the I learned so much from you. The the staff used to joke and call me Bramwell's shadow. I don't know if you knew that, um, because yeah. you so generously not only guided me in my development as a conductor and my technique and and also rehearsal technique, how to manage time and rehearsal, and all of that. I got to watch you do a lot, and also you watched me, um, which was invaluable. That practical experience, but. What I also got from you was how to run an audition, how to be in a board meeting, how to work with the staff. There's so many elements about being a music director that go beyond just being a conductor, not that being a conductor isn't enough. But the, the, the things, I, I'm going to ask you a little bit about your philosophy of, of mentorship, but I just wanted to comment that I sat in the audience with my husband, Dan, many times and watched you. And I remember thinking, it was, it was a real revelation to me because I remember sensing all the audience around me and as they reacted to you. And I had this thought, he is just like he's got everybody in his living room. And that breaking down of this sort of formal maestro attitude that had been so prevalent, even up until those, the 90s, I think, when, when we met, I think it was really a breath of fresh air for me. And I've, I've always been grateful to have seen that example because I've tried to model that in, in all of the concerts and all of the interactions that I have with the audience. So it was a really great life, learn, life learning lesson for me. So, so speak to me a little bit about your philosophy of mentorship because I know I was the first of many resident conductors and assistant conductors and students that you have had since then. Um. Well, uh, you were the first of, of many. And then for two years, um, I tried being, well, I didn't try, I enjoyed it. I was a university professor at Boston University in charge of the conducting program until I got too busy to keep it uh, sustained. And um, although I still keep in regular touch with my class, um, I'm no longer a professor. Being a professor these days is a full-time job, what with all the issues of um, justice and equality um, sexual awareness, all these kinds of things. And I just um, uh, felt that I couldn't give, I was only supposed to teach down half a week and I, I needed to give four or five days to the job. And so I gave it up a couple of years ago, but I missed it a lot. My daughter's still a student at Boston University. As you know, my daughter of whom, Rose, you are the godmother. Mm -hmm. And um, the, or have I got you right? Or were you my other daughter? I always get this confused. Emma, it's Emma. Emma. Hence the rose in Emma's name. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry. You'd think no, I'd know that, wouldn't you? I you love them I'd both equally. <laughs> Pathetic. Anyway. Um, I used the, to think um, that, Jessica. <laughs> I remember being no. there. Actually, Dad and I were there when you brought her yeah. home for the hospital. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, um, the, uh, uh, the, the issue about mentorship is, is important because I actually had very few mentors. When I um, left the Royal Academy of Music, I went to the, um, what's now the English National Ballet as an assistant conductor and rehearsal pianist. And Graham, uh, Graham Bond, who was the principal conductor, he supported me, helped me, mentored me, but I didn't really have much mentorship after that. And I, um, I missed that. And I think it was a, a minus in my life. Um, and uh, back in those days, that's in the 1970s, early 1970s, there was very little support for younger conductors. Mm -hmm. Lots of members of the orchestra, these people had Play, had been in the armed forces during the war, or they'd come out of prisoner of war camps. The last thing they wanted was a young conductor telling them what to do. What could I tell someone who'd been in Auschwitz what to do with their cello and how to express themselves? I, I mean, I was overwhelmed by, by that kind of, I, I just, I just, my job was to try and be clear and shut up. That was really what I was really um, trying very hard to do. So as, as, the, as the world has changed in the last 50, 40 years, um, I've, I wanted to uh, change how I felt about that. And as you know, we had very stringent music theor theoretical tests for that job. I mean, really stringent, the most stringent that I've heard of any audition of that process. It was really tough to get past that barrier. And we had a big orchestra vote. We had a big committee vote. And we, would, we, you know, we, we, took, on, we took you on with the full support of... Um, of all those constituents of the um, organization and you won against very stiff competition. So, um, you know, it was not, uh, that was not an easy win at all. I, I felt that um, what I wanted to do was to help those students that I worked with in ways that I never got the same help. 
how to rehearse, how to talk to the audience. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I, now, this is going to sound odd. I was brought up in the Salvation Army, as, as you know, and my name, Bramwell, um, Bramwell Booth was the son of the founder of the Salvation Army, and my grandfather worked on his staff in the 1920s. My grandfather was a Salvation Army officer on my mother's side, and I, she named her brother, Bra uh, uh, they named their, my mother's brother Bramwell, and then I was named Bramwell, um, and it was a curse while I was growing up because no one else was called Bramwell. But um, in, in later life, it's actually been quite useful. But anyway, I was, um, I was, uh, I learned how to public speak at the School Debating Society and in oh. the Salvation Army. And I, I don't remember- think I knew that you were a debater. I mean, it doesn't oh, yeah, I was a, me. I was an avid debater when I was, I mean, like, um, I even toyed at one stage um, with going into Parliament, but, oh, I'm so glad I didn't. Um, I, I, uh, I, I never, I mean, it was only when I was 17 or 18, I thought about it. Anyway, um, the, uh, the, the um, interesting thing about the Salvation Army is that um, the preaching was theologically very exact about, I didn't do any of that, but they did encourage that the preachers would lace their sermons and their prayers with smiling lines sometimes with laughter lines so that um i mean for instance i remember one uh uh um administrator they called him the sergeant major making the announcements for the week and this chap had a rich cockney accent and uh, in romford in essex and he came on one day he said um right he said monday night we're going to have the bible study Tuesday night is Songsters, the choir. Wednesday night, band practice. And Thursday night, youth practice. He said, on Friday morning, we're having the mother-in-law's outing. Big pregnant pause. He said, at the end of the service tonight, we're having a collection for the mother-in-law's outing. Don't forget, the more you give, the further we can send them. <laughs> and with just that little zinger in the back, um, your listening was rewarded. Now, that's a terrible line, according to, you know, we wouldn't say that nowadays. But back then, I realized the principle that if you can ping that zinger at the back of the, or even in the middle of what you're saying, people are going to listen to you more closely. And um, it was a trick I kind of watched a lot of Salvation Army officers and announcers do. And I used it in school debates. And I didn't really talk much in concerts in England um, until uh, just before I came to Canada. But I started using those kinds of zingers when I came to Winnipeg. And um, I found they went down well. And um, I just, uh, I've realized, as I've already alluded to, that the role of humor is very important. So that was something I also wanted to instill for um, conductors because there's nothing more boring than a conductor or a composer or frankly anyone um, reciting their PhD thesis sentence by sentence to an audience. I don't we know about never, you but I lose we, the will to live if that starts up. <laughs> now you talked about um, I wanted to ask you if in Winnipeg you founded the New Music Festival and you have a wonderful reputation in Canada for being a conductor who really champions our Canadian composers. And in fact, we claim you as a Canadian composer as well. You, do you did get your Canadian citizenship, I think, did you not? Rose, I'll tell your group here if you promise not to tell anyone. Um, I was a permanent resident for 20, 25 years and was so busy, I never got around to filling out the forms. My partner, Verena, filled out the forms for me a year ago, and my Canadian citizenship ceremony is on Zoom tomorrow. Oh, wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Can I watch? Oh, that makes me I don't, I'm not allowed to share the link, I'm afraid. Okay, um, well, I'm, uh, I, you will be in my thoughts, because I knew that it was in the process, and I couldn't yeah. remember. But I've been, I feel terrible and remiss about it. I mean, I, I actually got... When I, I was when I got the order at Kenner, I thought this is completely this is completely wrong. But they they kind of and they kind of embarrassingly meant the Governor General, not the present one or the one who was present, but the one before her, 
um, mentioned uh, ceremony that I was only an honorary officer of the Order of Canada until I finished my um, Your citizenship. Anyway, that's all very well, embarrassing. Preemptive congratulations, Bravo, for tomorrow. That is that thank is you. thrilling news. But I do want to I do want everybody to really know that that um, and you've really inspired me in this regard as well is how important it is to celebrate the voices in our own country. Um, and and in Canadian composition. And I know that you've been a prolific composer. I've been witness <coughs> to many of your compositions and, and they're stunning. So there's two questions I wanna ask you here um, because the first is to speak a little bit about you as an artist, as a composer, as composed compared to a com conductor. If you, th if you think of it as this, a similar expression or if it fits different parts of you as, a, as an individual and an artist. And the second is, um, I just spoke with Marion Newman yesterday. Hi. And Marion was telling me all about the workshop that she has just completed at Calgary Opera, which you put in place. Uh, Marion is a spectacular uh, mezzo-soprano from the Kogolo Stolo First Nation. Um, she sings all over the country. And in fact, she was Bramwell's choice of guest artist when the VSO did their tour. So you could talk a little bit about ancestral voices there. But I know that that you are doing, you know, not only have you empowered all these young conductors, but you're really, I think, so playing such an important role in empowering a much better sense of equality in our country um, through the arts and through giving a voice to so many different people. So that's a lot of questions, <laughs> but I think you just speak a little bit about composition and and who gets to be a composer, I guess? Well, that's um, interesting. Of course, anyone could compose. Anyone could be, gets to be a composer. But there are people who take it very seriously, especially when you, they've got these incredibly gifted musicians in front of them. And that needs an integrity and a follow through and a, a long learning curve to really um, to be able to um, join the expressive world of highly trained orchestral musicians. Um, well, I think that. Um, uh the, the 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 question of um of uh being a composer and a conductor is actually a very different thing as conductor i look at the music horizontally i need to get from this point to this point in this tempo then there is often a rallentando or an accelerando or tempos merge naturally i need to be in control of those moments so that the orchestra can make the music act organically I need to be able to cue, balance, listen, rehearse, fix it. And by and large, these are um, horizontal activities. I need to know, for example, when a, an architect builds an arch, they know that at the other end of the arch, there's gonna be a column. So the way they build the arch and how they land on the column is crucial. Um, when I do that in music, I also know that at the end, there's gonna be the equivalent of a musical column so I need to build that arch correctly according to what the composer has left me. Now, I'm afraid as a composer, I'm really, um, frankly, a vandal because I don't look at music in the same horizontal way all the time. I'm very concerned with syntax, with the verticals of it. It's almost like an author. You have a chapter of a novel, perhaps, that you want to write you want to get from this event in the story to this event and you use your words and then you go back and you change all the words and you 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 mix the syntax up and you put things uh, around the other way and, and you change things um and i think that um that's important important part of the process so you've lost sight almost of how you've got from first sentence to the last sentence because you've only now finally arrived where you want to be well the conductor has already got those words in the musical sense as, as composer, I conduct my stuff, I often think, too slowly. And I have to give myself uh, lectures sometimes about that because I'm looking at it from a syntax point of view um, instead of that horizontal point of view, which is really what I started on the piece in the first place. So I don't think I necessarily conduct my stuff the best. And I know that when I hear a recording, like when I first heard The Inventor, which I wrote for Calgary Opera, I was very happy with it. But when I came to do it in Vancouver, um, it was about 10 minutes shorter because um, I realized where I had, I had failed as conductor, not failed, perhaps that's too strong a word, but where I had not done everything that I should have done as a conductor. And so um, 
I think uh, they are two different roles. When it comes to empowering other composers, um, in Marion's case, um, with the songs Ancestral Voices that we did up at Ogunagan and on the Canadian tour, we actually took to Ottawa, Toronto, right. and oh. all over the place, um, and Winnipeg actually as well. Um, I wanted to write a piece that talked about reconciliation because I had spent some time talking about this issue with Marion and with Gordon Gerard, who was our great mutual friend. And I was very aware of issues of cultural appropriation. You know, I don't want to be that um, old white geezer who um, tries to take tribal drums and powwow music and stick it in his white Eurocentric language. That wasn't, that was that long 50, 60 years ago, not now. And so I, I talked to Marion about how I might do this. And I came up with the idea that I would use the text, all texts by white European men. And we found some very sensitive texts, very sensitive poetry, and we found some absolute terrible things. And um, I, I sent, as I was, we found these texts, Marion sent me a couple of things, I sent her things, and I sent her back what I wanted to set and she sent me comments. And so when we began, she knew exactly what the text was that I was going to set, and she was 100% behind it. I set the text, I avoided, I hope, any um, cultural appropriate cliches. And um, I feel very, um, I felt very rewarded by her performance, deeply moved, because to have Marion, as it were, read these words about First Nations that were written by, um, you know, my cultural ancestors brought a different perspective on the whole thing. And so I was, I was pleased, I can't speak if the music was any good, but I think the concept worked. So when it came to working with um, Marion at Calgary Opera, I was artistic director at Calgary Opera for two years until I had to give up on the return of my cancer last year. Um, I, um, I watched the, um, I talked to Marion about wanting her to come to, to Calgary. And I said that I might, normally I would choose a composer, choose a director, choose a librettist, put them all together in a room, tell them to come up with a workshop, create an opera. But it felt all wrong because it wasn't my story that I wanted her to tell. I wanted her to tell her story. So I went to Marion and I said, okay, I would like you to be the dramaturge. I'd like you to be the director. You choose the composers, you choose the artists and Calgary Opera will be your infrastructure. I'm the artistic director, but all I'm gonna do is to make sure that what you want is enabled behind the scenes so you don't have to worry about it. I will make no decisions, we trust you. And so I gave a full remit on this and the workshop was two weeks ago. I saw it online. And um, it's really remarkable. And uh, I mean, I think she's a future COC company director in the making personally. And uh, I think uh, she's a fantastic um, creative artist herself. Um, she was a top flight um, concert pianist growing up in her teens yeah. before she decided to concentrate on, on voice. I mean, she's really, she's a great artist by any standards. And, um, uh, I actually felt that that was the way that companies should be proceeding in this, especially this post COVID world now of saying, mm -hmm. well, if we're gonna tell um, stories about First Nations people, um, we don't wanna hear white people telling them anymore. We want to hear the stories of themselves. Um, and it's the same, I think, with, um, with uh, all kinds of indigenous music. We don't need to have crises about it. We don't need to have, I don't believe in having guilt trips um, you know, my, I come from a very, very poor working class background. Uh, if you go back two generations, my, all my uh, grandparents left school at 13, uh, 14, and uh, my parents too. So, you know, it's, I don't come from any special, my, my grandfathers, uncles, great grandparents were all being shot at in the first world war and second world war as the poor bloody infantry in the trenches. So, you know, I don't come from anything special. Uh, and so um, I'm not, I don't think, I, I, I don't really have it in my DNA to be responsible for that guilt, but I do have it in my collective cultural responsibility. And that's where I wanna try and make a difference. 
and that's so, where that came from. Bramwell, I want to share with you something in the chat. You'll you'll remember Anne Doyen, who, uh, when we were at the Annalton Center and you and Marianne performed when you were here touring, Anne was the chef that created that beautiful lunch and shared the Janis Joplin song with us at the end that made us all cheer and scream with laughter. And Anne um, says in the chat, thank you for giving voice to the Indigenous people of Canada through your work. I will always love it. Please take care of yourself, sir. We need you on the planet. Oh, how much, lovely. Much love. And she had to head back to work. So she uh, she put that lovely. So I just wanted you to know that you made a big impact when you were here. Well, and uh, I look forward to to the other voices that you create. I know that we are rapidly coming to the end of our time today. Um, is there any other anything else that you would like to share with our audience today? Anything about um, how you feel about music or conducting or how you're navigating both COVID and cancer and trying to, to keep this music alive in this day or any any words of closing? Well, I'm, I'm, I've, I've kept out of uh... I've, I've not been very, the first six months of, of uh, COVID, I, I was um, thought to have been cancer free, so I didn't have any treatment. And then um, in uh, September, they discovered that the, uh, the tumor was resurgent. It's in my chest wall here. It's, it's away from my organs. So I'm very, very lucky. I had a couple of scares, um, which turned out to be false alarms. Um, but I do have, a, I have a particular type of cancer that doesn't have a cure, it's very rare but it, it's manageable. So um, I'm, I've been very, very fortunate. I have found, um, I mean, I'm going to chemo in about an hour and a half and I will go into a, um, a small room, um, a ward with people in each corner and um, they could be any age. They could be teenagers, they could be 20 somethings, they could be uh, old, 80 years old, uh, and we get chatting and we all talk about, and sometimes I get recognized. Usually I've got a mask on though, so I don't, the people recognize my voice. And, um, and then uh, we start chatting and uh, you hear people's stories. And I, I met a lady about, about three weeks ago who um, elegant, beautifully dressed, um, beautifully spoken. Um, I know that she was nearly 80 because we all had to give our birthdays as our code you know, for, to make sure they've got the right uh, chemo for treatment. So it's embarrassing when you hear someone's age, uh, they, uh, but everyone, whatever, we're just in this together, you know? And um, she asked me about my tumor. So I was, you know, telling her um, the story and um, it's very natural to reciprocate. It's almost rude not to reciprocate if someone asks you. So I asked her about hers and she said, well, I have, um, I've had, uh, problems in my um, ovaries and womb. I said, oh, I hope everything's going well. And she said to me, um, I'm in palliative tumor now. I haven't got long to go. And the peace and the tranquility on this woman's face was breathtaking and completely without self-pity. Um, and she said that uh, getting to the point where she realized that it was now palliative. Um, she had determined in advance that she was gonna make sure that when that moment arrived, she was going to make the best of what came after that moment. And I was just deeply inspired by what she said. I'm not at that place at all. I'm you know, feisty and fighting and everything else that I can. Um, but I was so impressed by her inner strength and power of strength that I have realized that actually this whole battle with cancer, um, which has affected my musical expression and musical life deeply, as well as you know, the COVID stuff, of course, but has really, uh, it's got a kickback, which says, hang on a minute, there's a lesson over here. You can learn about human communication and you can learn about being a better person and you can learn about, um, about how you can serve others. Um, it's been inspiring and um, although because I've got kids I want to see grow up they're in their 20s now but and, I, and I've got grandchildren now and I want to see them grow up and I want to be better again um, I, in a funny kind of way I would not have gone without this experience if I'd known <clears throat> what it was going to give me as a person as I got older and that's a weird thing to say 
No, I thank you for sharing that, Brahma. It's deeply, deeply moving. You once again bringing me. You, you're almost always an encounter I have with you. I'm either you either bring me to laughter or to tears, and often both. Oh. <laughs> and that's happened today. Um, <coughs> is there any? Uh, just as we close, is there a role uh, that music is playing for you in this, in your recovery and as you go through these treatments and any piece of special music that you would like to share with us that uh, our listeners might want to go and, and, um, and check out and listen to in solidarity with you? Well, you know, um, the music that I often get asked about, what would I listen to? Um, somebody's asked about playlist here. Um, I enjoy very much the works of Delius. And I don't perform them that much because they're not that popular. <coughs> they, re they require you to sit in a chair and surrender to what Delius has to say. And he always hugs you. And so I've enjoyed listening to Delius and a lot of early works of Vaughan Williams, not so much the symphonies, which I personally find sometimes a bit puffed up and overblown, but the early tone poems of Vaughan Williams um, the rhapsodies, the folk rhapsodies, the um, uh, um, works that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> works that include the incredibly popular things like Lark Ascending and Talis Fantasia, the, the works that come before that too, they're, they're deeply moving as he's trying to find his way in the world to express um, whom he is. And I've listened to a lot of chamber music because my life has been filled with orchestral music. I've played a lot of chamber music, but mostly, you know, when there's been piano in it. And my daughter, Jessica, um, is, is really into the string quartet, really into sonata playing. We play a lot together. So I've been listening to a lot of string quartets, the Beethoven string quartets. And, uh, uh, you know, I sit in hospital and I've got my phone and I download and um, I just put the headphones on and I've got three hours of, um, you know, being plugged into this stuff. And um, I usually sit down and decide at the moment what I'm gonna to listen to. Also, I've listened to some of my own stuff and realized how ridiculously slow it is when I conduct. So I've been trying to teach myself that lesson as well. So I'm hearing a lot of your, um, your go-to music is that British voice, that pastoral, um, I mean, Lark Ascending's one of the most stunning pieces of music ever written. And, and I'll share with you that you introduced me to Delius. And I actually, that was my conductor's choice piece, The Walk to the Paradise Garden, on my audition concert with the Okanagan Symphony. So, oh. so there you go. I'm not sure if I've ever told you that before. How about, and is, there a, is there a dream piece that you want to conduct with your first venture back after COVID allows us to perform live again? Well, um... You know, it's interesting because I'm, um, I'm hoping, first of all, I'm going to be over the cancer by the summer. And then when I'm back, um, I would have, uh, is, is it what's going to be first? Am I going to be conducting? Will it be, it might be the New York Phil, it might be Hollywood Bowl, it might be the proms. I'm even, I even got an invitation two months ago to go to Korea in June with Jimmy Edders. And I don't know if I can do that, but if I do that, That'll be Sibelius. So, but so I'm not really sure what's going to be the first concert because it keeps getting postponed or cancelled or, or you know, um, uh, uh, chucked uh, into next season. So I'm I'm not entirely sure. But I think what I'm trying to do is to make sure that every concert that comes up has an integrity and a reason. And at the moment, in Rhode Island, for instance, where I'm going to open the season, all being well, in uh, September, I'm talking about. Um, a new version of we're going to do the stars and stripes because it's in america mm -hmm. and then there's a new version of the it's called the banner by jesse montgomery a black mm -hmm. um rhode island composer who's really getting played a lot in the u.s and then i have uh, susan platz the canadian american mezzo soprano is going to sing the rook at the leader of mm -hmm. marla and then we're going to do beethoven five in the second half so that's my planned first concert um uh, of the season, but uh, I've got, you know, bits of um, other stuff, but I'm trying to avoid Marla at the moment because if you put too many people on stage, there'll be some Jobsworth health person who'll come along and say, the choir have got to wear masks and you 
hardly want to sing about being liberated with a mask on. <laughs> and I've got Beethoven 9 at the end of the year. I should be safe by then. So. Hopefully. Well, yeah. Bramall, I wish you all the best in your ability to be able to get back on stage as soon as possible. Of course, as we all are able to, but but um, for your personal circumstances as well. And, you know, Hollywood Bowl and New York Phil and the proms, I will all be lucky to have you. And I, uh, as we head into the spring here in the Okanagan, I encourage you all to go and have a listen to Ray Fun Williams' Lark Ascending and the Walk to the Paradise Garden by Delius. I can't thank you enough for being my first guest. I can't believe it's the first time I've ever interviewed you. It's been, uh, we've been known each other for almost 25 years. And I'm it's always an deeply, deeply grateful to everything that you have brought to me personally in my development as a conductor and music director and a human being. Um, but such a big gift you've brought to our country through your music and your your deep humanity. And oh. it's just been such a joy to share this time with you today. We're all thinking about you and sending huge healing, healing energy um, to beat this cancer and have, have a, a, a glorious third act to your career of the next decades. We look forward to seeing you again. That's so sweet of you. Thank you very much for having me. You know, you feel in with the Okanagan, it's like... Uh, it's, a, it's still being at home. It's like being in Vancouver. It feels a very safe space and it's such an honor to be uh, your first guest. Congratulations and uh, on everything you've achieved with this uh, incredible orchestra. It's a shining example of um, how great uh, a, 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 an orchestra um, of this particular quality can be in, in our country. So fantastic. Thank you, Bramwell. I hope you'll all join us again on March 25th my next guest is Daniel Bartholomew Poyser, who was one of my students. So we're, we're taking it to a completely different level and Daniel's enjoying a really robust and exciting career. So I look forward to speaking with him. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Bramwell, thank you so much. We'll be in touch soon. Take thanks care. everybody. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.